Hi everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Rob. I'm the Director of Policy, Advocacy and Programmes at Verwell. And this is our third conversation. So now we're going to be moving to talking about unlocking early child education. So we're going to the other side of a child's life, two decades before the, de before the world of work. Most people are really surprised to learn that 90% of the brain develops before the age of five, yet 175 million children never go to preschool. Moreover, the international community collectively invests just 26 cents per child per year in the poorest countries for preschool education. Yet if you come from a wealthy country, thousands of dollars could be spent a year on a year of preschool. With COVID, parents and caregivers are playing an even greater role in their children's development. So I'm so happy to be joined by four experts and change makers with me today. Firstly, Peter Lohan, President and CEO of the Conrad Hilton Foundation. Alex Albright, CEO of the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, Ms. Seema uh, Wazid Hussain, uh, Chairperson of the Shoshona Foundation and also Chairperson of the Bangladesh National Advisory Committee for Autism. And Eden Tenese, uh, fantastic Global Youth Ambassador in Ethiopia. In this session, we want to explore what the biggest challenges are for early child education and how we can make sure we fund quality and inclusive early years. So firstly, Peter, over to you. The Hilton Foundation has made the early years one of its priorities. Can you tell us a bit why you've done that and how COVID-19 has impacted early child education? Sure, uh, thanks Rob, happy to be here. Uh, the Hilton Foundation has invested in early childhood in East and Southern Africa for the last 10 years. And we will be expanding in the coming years to working in the United States and in refugee contexts. We're a strong believer uh, in global commitment to, to early childhood. Um, and I think I, I wanted to put two reasons on the table today. One is the role of early childhood in human capital development. Uh, and, and the second is the need for partnerships between ministries of education and ministries of health. If you look at human capital, uh, clearly uh, this is key to economic progress. Uh, 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 a primary topic here uh, at this seminar. And it's also uh, a, a response to the two challenges that are in front of us, global development and sustainability and equity, uh, equitable economies within countries and between countries. Uh, and the evidence is clear, as you said, Rob, 90% of brain development in the first five years and long-term research, 55 years of it, have shown that the return on investment for early childhood is about $17 for every $1, uh, compared to uh, closer to one for one for a tertiary education. This is definitely the place where we get the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, it's also uh, the place where school readiness is developed and therefore student achievement and also the efficiency of primary education, topics I'm sure that are dear to Alice's, um, Alice's heart. So uh, in terms of where we are though, we're not performing as if we knew those facts. Uh, multilateral development banks are doing the best. They've put a lot of uh, funding into early childhood, the World Bank and our American Development Bank, uh, but they could do much more. Bilaterals, none of them, even though in OECD, every OECD country there is a head start or a smart start, no bilateral has made early childhood. It's one of its uh, key global public policy priorities and they should. Uh, National governments are really important for the uptake of early childhood. The GPE has a major uh, role to play here as interlocutor. Uh, at policy, policy dialogue, priority, these are all very important. I wanted to bring one other point in, uh, and that is the, uh, the collaboration between ministries of health and ministries of education. Here we're talking about early childhood education specifically, and the 10% goal, a uh, really laudable one from, from their world. But we also need to make sure that ministries of health are doing their role early in children's life. Uh, and that's why we've worked with the World Health Organization to develop the Nurturing Care Framework, which has five pieces to it. Health, nutrition, safety and security, good parenting, and early stimulation and learning. The, uh, the early stimulation and learning come directly from the Ministry of Health and so does safety and security, part of it. But a big part of that the health and the nutrition comes from ministries of health, and they need to work very closely with ministries of education for these benefits to be realized. Thanks. Thanks so much, Peter. And as you say, here at Their World, we've really been calling for 10% of education budgets to be committed to this kind of critical phase of preschool education. Um, Eden, over to you. You've been leading a, a fantastic campaign for early child education. 
Can you uh, tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I just want to say um, that how honored I am to be a global youth ambassador for their world. Uh, and with this platform and my voice, I am urging governments and aid donors to invest at least 10% of their education budgets into early childhood education. So the current aid to education is less than 1%, but to achieve the sustainable development goals, it will need to increase to 10% annually. Um, 175 million children are without early childhood education globally, and COVID has worsened that figure by 40 million. As we know, early childhood education is monumentally important for our children's cognitive development, their future success. Um, so with this funding, we will not just be able to empower today's leaders, but to prepare them for the global economy that awaits them tomorrow. So swift action must be taken right now to ensure that early childhood education is given the support and funding that it needs. And this campaign is a start to achieving that. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Um, and Alice, the Global Partnership for Education brings together governments working on their sector plans and provides funding to back up those plans, really trying to invest in education systems. Can you tell us a bit about how, how you at GP, how you're encouraging countries to invest more in, in early childhood education? Uh, thank you, Rob, and it's a great, uh, great pleasure to be here with everybody and say hello and reconnect, and I'm uh, so sorry we're not doing this in person. But just a few brief thoughts. Uh, first of all, GPE, as many of you know, is uh, one of the largest funding platforms uh, in education. Uh, we work very closely with governments to help them uh, think through what their priorities are in education and then help uh, get those priorities through uh, a policy planning and implementation process and also bring uh, funding to the table to match up with uh, what is a much larger source of funding, which is domestic funding. Through this, uh, we realize that there is not a one-size-fits-all approach and that the policy dialogue needs to take uh, different uh, directions uh, depending on what uh, countries identify their own priorities to be. Uh, very briefly, we do three potential things depending on what countries are interested in doing. One is around the policy dialogue, and as you know, countries put in place every few years uh, a new education strategy. Uh, that's often where they choose to, to uh, where they identify their priorities, and often they realize that early childhood education is something that needs to be bolstered. So that's the first thing. The, the second is funding. Uh, we are becoming a major uh, provider of discretionary funding to education, uh, and we see that almost in every grant the GPE uh, has on its books, uh, there is an investment of one kind or another in early childhood. Uh, had we had more time, I'd give you lots of examples, but I have examples that I could share with you on Guyana, Uzbekistan, Djibouti, uh, just to give you three. And there's lots of information on our website, and this will give you kind of a line-by-line -line description of what we're doing uh, to help provide funding for countries who want to uh, provide uh, additional resource to early childhood. Um, the next thing that we're doing is our new knowledge and innovation exchange called KIX, K-I-X. Uh, KICS was set up now about two years ago or so in partnership with the IDRC in Canada uh, to address what is a uh, sort of a, an across the board lack in education, which is in particular, if you look at the health sector, there's a noticeable lack in education of funding going for knowledge products and, uh, and global goods around knowledge and information sharing, uh, good ideas about what works, the evidence behind it. So what you see is a lot of smaller ideas, but you don't necessarily see them coming together and coming to scale. So KIX was designed to uh, in part address that gap. Uh, it has identified six different domain areas, which are areas of emphasis uh, around uh, education. And these are areas that I think there's common consensus around where are the challenges. And early childhood education is one of them. Uh, KIX has gone from the sort of initial setup stage to now the operational stage. Uh, there's many different types of grants that go globally, regionally, um, I won't run you through all the details, but we're very excited uh, because early childhood education is one of these areas where we expect that there's going to be a harnessing of global knowledge that can then be shared at the country level for countries uh, to take it on uh, and begin to put it into practice um, in their uh, implementation activities. And KIX is the largest innovation platform of its kind. It's been funded at $75 million dollars. Uh, and we're very excited about what it portends about the possibility of getting additional focus into early childhood. Um, so those are the tools. Uh, it's money, it's policy dialogue, and it's knowledge and innovation uh, focus on it. And we look forward to 
uh, hearing some further good ideas and working with all of you to try to keep a focus on this very critical area. So back over to you, Rob. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Alice. Um, and we'll look forward to kind of sharing those examples in the chat as well and kind of really hearing all that kind of positive cases where, where countries really have taken the lead. Um, and talking of that, um, handing over to you now, uh, uh, Saima, in, uh, in Bangladesh. Um, the early years are so important, and particularly you work very closely with kind of children with disabilities. Um, can you explain a bit about why the early years is so important for, for those children? Well, what, what science tells us now, the early years are the most critical. You have 7,000 neural connections that are formed in every second from the time an infant is born. And uh, when knowing about the, what, how the brain develops, how the brain learns, um, we know that now there's a lot of early interventions that can occur that perhaps possibly used to occur very organically because you had a uh, very stimulating multi-generational family systems. And this is particularly in, in countries like Asia, in Asia and in Bangladesh, you used to have a lot of more support systems. Now family structures are changing, resources are limited, parents are usually both working and it creates an environment where all of the you know things that have been mentioned in the nurture and care framework aren't always possible. So you have made the shift into uh, you know daycares and uh, Head Start programs, but we are again within that support system missing the first twelve months, missing the first six months. When it comes to disability in particular, the other issue is a lot of the times when it's developmental delays, when there is um, organic conditions, you're completely reliant on parents recognizing it and then bringing it to the health um, service centers. So in countries like Bangladesh, you have to ensure that you have health service centers, which a lot of the times you don't. And you don't have parents who are that knowledgeable about what to expect exactly to learn the indicators. Along with learning the indicators, going to the, uh, you know, the rights of health and social support systems, you, you also need parents to be able to help the child provide this, the stimulation because there's a lot of research that's shown that an intervention that would take about 10 days when the child is five months, if the delay was recognized, takes about a whole year later on when it's recognized mm -hmm. at five years. The average age for uh, an autism diagnosis uh, or development of to be really confirmed, even now is after five years, when we've missed all of the opportunities for the intervention to you know, be provided exactly when the brain is at its peak to gain those skills. So if we don't provide, have a combined sort of method to address this, we are sort of setting up children, particularly who, who have a disability or are at risk for having a disability to continue being uh, get worse. One of the things that we realize working with Chuchana Foundation and, and as an advisor and part of the advisory chairman of the advisory committee in Bangladesh is that we don't have a lot of resources. Okay, so we're looking at how do we get resources to, um, you know, to the most least educated populations, to even the daycare programs the Bangladesh government has started. This, you know, you can teach about growth, uh, which the medical community will have about this programs on nutrition, but what, what you don't have is social communication information. You don't have behavior management techniques. And this, this is a real gap, especially because you, you need to provide it in, in a very natural, organic environment. You don't always need it to be in a clinical setting. This is not replicable. The behaviors learned aren't replicable. And with Children of Foundation, we have designed specific module that teaches social communication, that teaches positive behavior parenting, and it fits in nicely with nutrition programs and fits in nicely with, you know, play skills, all of the other things. And hopefully we, are, we are, will be piloting it that very soon in Bangladesh. I think it was mentioned, you know, the health and education sector. 
For us, we have an added ministry. We have a ministry of women and child affairs. So mm -hmm. we've got three ministries that we're trying to work and address this issue. And so it becomes extremely complicated and you have to involve and engage a partnership with parents because like I said, first two years, there are no programs there. So how do you bridge this gap is a core issue and it's a resource that really needs to develop and has to be investment early so that we, you know, it will pay dividends later. Thank you. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, Aidan, if we just quickly come to you, can you give us a bit of a highlight of what the situation is in, in Ethiopia on early child education? Yeah, sure. Um, so Ethiopia has had measurable progress over the past decade, uh, with the rate of early childhood education increasing from four to four to six percent in the span of six years. Um, however, the, uh, the, the pandemic has caused the national lockdown of schools, forcing 26 million children out of 42,000 schools. It's estimated that one in four children will drop out of primary schools, and it's been especially tougher on children in underserved communities. But the Ministry of Education has actually decided to reopen schools this month with teachers mm -hmm. leading small socially distant classrooms with hygiene facilities, uh, and they're building additional classrooms as we speak to support marginalized children in, in all regions in Ethiopia and also liaising with community-based organizations to get more volunteer teachers and educational facilities. So Ethiopian government and the UNICEF have also um, developed a national policy framework for early childhood education, which includes um, getting more professionally trained teachers and creating rigorous um, educational programs. So yeah, a lot of cross-sector collaboration is happening to facilitate the return of students and ensure that early childhood ed education is more uh, equitable, more accessible, relevant, and of higher quality. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so kind of to wrap this up, I'm going to come to each of you and and kind of with a real kind of punchy, you know, unlocking big change, kind of ask you to say what's the kind of one thing that really needs to happen to, 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 to make a difference here in early child education. Uh, Peter, I'll come to you first. Uh, support the 10% uh, of resources to early childhood, support efforts at country level, strengthen country level evidence, Join networks uh, like the Global Business Council of Education, Edu Early Childhood Development Action Network, um, and support community activists such as Eden. Thanks. Amazing. Fantastic. Uh, Seema, to you. Uh, partnership with parents. I think very early on, uh, training and supporting parents and empowering them so that they're uh, the change makers and part of, along with creation of innovative infrastructure and support mechanisms, using technology in a way that we can get access to much more specialized care without making it very onerous and very, uh, you know, um, costly for uh, low resource families. Brilliant. Uh, Alice? I'll just say four quick words, advocacy, evidence, scale and funding. Uh, with regard to funding, uh, we already have one year of our early childhood education as part of our, our sort of funding scope. Uh, and as we move into our new uh, strategic plan, it will continue to stay there along with 12 years of, uh, of I'll just say quickly, older education. Um, but we take this very, very seriously because of the science and we will continue to do so. Fantastic. And we're really looking forward to seeing that new strategy coming out for, for the kind of coming years and the big replenishment effort behind it. Uh, and Eden, a final word to you. Um, I just want to say um, that we should support grassroots organizations as much as possible. I think having worked for one for many years, uh, they're really able to mobilize people and resources as much as they can, especially in a short period of time. Uh, and a time, for example, right now where we're in a global crisis. Uh, so yeah, support them as much as you can, because um, you're doing really great work. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much to to amazing panelists. Um, really appreciate your contributions and spending time with us. Um, I think now we're going to kind of transition into uh, a video about a new tool that we've developed. We're calling it the Key. Uh, so this is a tool that Their World and the Global Business Coalition for Education are really proud to launch, which is a public source tool for youth advocates, governments, companies, and foundations alike to really make the case for education. So a kind of go-to resource. Um, so yeah, and with that, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.